I don't know about you guys, but I always sit cross-legged when I chat with you. <laughs> Welcome back, you guys. I'm Tassie, and this is my Shaman Memoirs channel. So in this episode, we're going to be talking a bit about smudging. And then towards the end of the video, I'm going to tell you guys about the time when I almost got sat on recently. This was back in December. So let's get started. All right, so I was asked if I believe that smudging in general, the practice of it, does it work? So personally, based off of actual experience I have had, I'm going to say yes and no. And it could be that I had a bad experience with it. I don't know. But I want to let you guys know, for anyone who's not familiar with smudging, it's actually a Native American practice. It's been around for centuries. I'd be like shocked if there was anybody who didn't know about smudging. Um, just because it's pretty popular in like pop culture and movies and references and stuff like that. So even though it started off as a Native American type of ritual or practice that they do, there's a lot of cultures that actually do it. Personally, I know of a girl who actually did do smudging. So I'm going to tell you guys this story about the time when I was stupid and I house sat a haunted house for two weeks. So basically with smudging, you typically use sage. That's pretty common, but there are other items that you guys can actually burn instead of just sage. Um, I actually know because I looked it up once. I had to Google it for my girlfriend who was doing it. So we were Googling where can you buy like bundles of sage because you got to burn the whole bundle. And okay, we'll get back to that. But um, there's there are like stores catered for those who practice Wicca. So, you know, in a nutshell, it's a witch store. I have never gone into one, but when I was in New Orleans, we definitely went to a voodoo store. That was pretty cool. However, you know, like my facial expression, it's the, um, it was really touristy, definitely catered for tourists, you know, like voodoo dolls galore. And, um, you know, it just felt really kitschy, like where it was more of a tourist attraction and that's how they're getting a lot of the money. So, you know, it wasn't like what you would expect, like a real witch store to be, uh, do I know what one is? No, I've never been in one. <laughs> but I was just saying, I was kind of expecting, you know, like the obvious, they have a lot of journals where they can write a lot of their spells, lots of different types of candles. Um, they do use cauldrons, okay? Don't come at me. Okay. <laughs> I did study Wicca for a little, little, little bit, but they will sometimes use it and you can use just a bowl and that represents your cauldron. And that is actually one of the elements. I think it's air. I can't, I could be wrong, but I just want to let you guys know that, um, that's kind of like what I was thinking. All right. But it wasn't like a bunch of, you know, like stones, like crystals and you know, like, helps you find northeast like compasses you know like to find your cardinal rules and it wasn't anything like that at all um there were some candles but you know it was definitely really touristy i have not been to the one up here in uptown that's right there is actually one in minneapolis here i've never been to it i've seen it and they i think it's like the eye of horus or something like that it's in the window but anyways my girlfriend, I don't know where she went, but she ended up finding the sage and she went out and bought it. Um, a lot of people I know, especially those who practice Wicca, they, there's forums and they tend to have to buy things online be just because it's not as easily accessible, like to buy. All right. So then my girlfriend, she invited me over because she was going to smudge her house and her house is really haunted. And I've told her on many occasions, girl, your house is haunted. And she lives in a townhouse, kind of like in the middle. So it's not like she has like an end unit or anything like that. And you know, she's those, she's white and she really didn't want to, not that she didn't believe in it, but she didn't want to admit to it that her house was haunted. Um, so what she does, as soon as she gets home from work, she has the TV on until she knocks out. She will never be in her house like alone, right? So one day, all of a sudden she just messages me and she actually tells me, okay, I think my house is haunted. <laughs> so something had happened where it really scared her. So we were like, okay, well, she was like, what should I do? And she was like, you know what? Uh, she's been researching online and she's going to do smudging of her house. And I was like, okay, like, you know, do you want me to be there? And so she invited me over 
And when I got there, she had just actually finished. So she started a little earlier than the time when we were supposed to meet up because she started getting really nervous. Kind of like, I think she thought like the entities or whatever knew we were about to smudge the house. So she started feeling really anxious. So then she started. Um, and you know, I think like with smudging, especially with people who don't normally practice it, people can sometimes become very nervous and they don't necessarily always want an audience. So I definitely think she was more so, she wanted me to come over really to tell her if it was still haunted. <laughs> so I get there and it stinks. And I did not, I felt really, really irritated at the house. I did not feel like it was light and cleansed. And honestly, I felt like the spirits that were in that house, they were very, very irritated as well. But, you know, a lot of times I'll have people who will want confirmation. So especially if I know them in real life and I'm at an event or even at a ceremony, I've had shamans ask me personally, do you think it worked? And I, I'll be honest, I shy away from telling people my honest opinion. And this is the part where people always say I sugarcoat things because they can't handle the truth. Okay. So I do not want to be the person that basically disheartens somebody. So, you know, with her, I just said, why don't you just wait a few days and see how things go? Like, you know, you did the smudging. I'm sure you're going to be fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> Because, you know, I mean, I definitely felt the spirits still there and they were really agitated. I was getting agitated and I don't really know how to personally smudge. I only know about the theory of how it actually works. So let's get into that. Personally, I would never smudge myself just because I just said to you guys, I don't really know the magics and inner workings of that. I am not saying that it does not work. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that if it's a magic that my own guides do not teach me, I will not practice it. Um, and a lot of that has to go with trust in what I am about to do versus I think this is how it's going to work. And so I do it, you know? So that is the only reason because my guides would not want me to do a smudging type of ritual. I wouldn't do it. So with the smudging, you get a bushel of sage. Let's say it's sage and you set it on fire. Okay. Like just the tips <laughs> and it's normally bunched really tight together. Okay. And it looks like, like this, it's not like, you know, like a bouquet of flowers, a sage. Okay. It's actually tightly bound together. So then they actually set the tip of it on fire and then you kind of stamp out the fire just so there's no flames. And then what happens is it's now just smoke. Okay. You take that stick of sage and you kind of go around the whole house and you say a blessing and the blessing again, it's very personal to the individual, whatever it is that they want to bless the house. Some people will bless, and this isn't just a house. It could be an individual or an item that they want cleansed. So people will also do that as well. Um, and personally, I don't like the smell of burning sage. I know some people they'll use like lavender and stuff like that too. So it's really up to the individual, but they do recommend you opening up windows when you're doing it to kind of like release the spirits and also to help with ventilation. And then whenever you're done, you want to kind of stamp out the whatever you use, whether it's lavender or uh, sage, you want to stamp it out and you can actually use it again if you didn't burn the whole thing throughout the whole house. Okay. So I think it's um, a really interesting theory as far as how it's similar to how Hmong people and shamans, we would cleanse our own house. So there are multiple ways of cleansing a house. It can depend on your family lineage and what you guys actually practice, just like the Sika. So that's really up to you guys. Um, however, as a shaman, you can actually go into the spirit world and cleanse the house too. So again, it's really different methods, but it is similar to how Hmong people would, would cleanse a house to burning sage. So typically, you know, we start at the door and then we will cleanse around the house and we will use like some joss money, some people. So what I'm saying, it depends on your lineage. Some people will use like a branch broken from outside. 
in conjunction with the Joss money. Some people will even use a red string tied around the branch, etc. And then they will actually walk around and brush the doors, um, walk throughout the whole rooms, the whole perimeters of the rooms. You go to the basement, you go up to the attic as far as you can, and then you lean it all the way outside. During the new year, typically you'll take like a, somebody will be with a broom behind you and they'll help to change. Okay, so that's actually um, sweeping of the house. So a person will be behind you kind of sweeping as you're going along as well. So again, it's different methods that you guys could do. Then after you've gone throughout the house and you're saying words of protection and blessing, and then you take it outside and then you will actually burn that stuff outside because that is representing you giving it to the spirit, especially the money, you got paying them to leave. So, you know, it's um, again, a give and a take kind of a situation for a lot of shaman practices. So that is how we typically cleanse a house before you actually move in um, into a house before you put any of your actual possessions into that place. Typically you would chain the house, sweep the house. So I do think that it's interesting how it is similar. I mean, as far as like the action of going around the house, saying a blessing of, or a spell of protection of somehow throughout the house, um, different types of tools apparently are used obviously. Um, and then, but there's still the burning, you know, however, for us, we give something in exchange to ensure the deal is done. That's about it. So for myself, when I actually do it, my spirit guides, they speak out the magic and the verses for me as I am cleansing a house and you can cleanse anytime once you've moved in. Okay. Don't think it's just, you know, only when you move in. You can cleanse. Um, typically, that's why we always recommend when you raise up the Sakat, the new year, before the year is over, etc., and you're raising up a new one, you want to cleanse the house before you do that. Um, obviously, for ceremonies, it's done already in the spirit world when a shaman is actually doing it. Now, going back to my girlfriend's story with her house there, oh, it's still haunted. But I will definitely say that, you know, I, honestly, it's um, a lot of it does have to do with evoking of the power, which I always mention. I always talk about manifestation and really your own energy because some people will actually call on another entity to help them. And I, and I know that for Wiccans, they believe in that. So they will call on some type of spirit for help. And, you know, for shamans in general, sometimes they will as well. So, you know, generally they do because our spirit guides, okay? but I'm just saying, so typically it's a kind of like a, you either do it with your own strength, your own energy and your own, basically your bandwidth, whatever you have. So, you know, some people will do that. Whereas others, they will actually call on something much stronger, much powerful. Now, granted, you don't always know if they come unless you are an individual who can see and speak to spirits or you have a gut instinct and a gut feeling that they are there. Sometimes, though, you know, a lot of times they're going to want something in exchange, though, for offering you or helping you with these type of situations and scenarios. Um, unless you have some kind of understanding or agreement, then you can always typically call on that entity to come and help you. But again, that's really going to depend on the individual. <laughs> So when I was, but when I was there, I definitely felt really irritated and agitated. It was just, I felt like there's something wrong, like in my chest and I knew that it was not good. She pretty much noticed within a couple of days that it was, probably didn't work. Um, but you know, it was something where she wanted to keep practicing at it and cleansing her house and she kept wanting to ignore it. Uh, definitely, you know, I did talk to her a bit about the shaman side on what we would typically do. So, you know, like if the sage and the cleansing of the house isn't working, you don't got the funds or you don't got the help or the time for a whole ceremony, people would typically just use breast milk. So, you know, she was pretty much fine with just the sage and, you know, it was something like, it's not like she actually practices those kind of things. Um, she grew up definitely going to church, but now she no longer goes, but she is spiritual in kind of her own way, not, um, she doesn't like structure pretty much. Like if 
somebody tells you this is the only way you can do it. She, she's, she's an individual who does not like to do that. It is going to be what she feels and what she wants. So definitely she still wanted to go the sage route, even though she knows her house is still haunted. And so I refuse to house it for her now. Um, after I saw the dead cat looking at me. So I just, no, like I don't like to watch TV and I don't like to have a TV on in general. I don't like to hear a lot of black and white noises. And so for whenever I was house sitting for her, I didn't have the TV on. And oh my God, I mentioned this in another video. Like there were things moving and running around upstairs going crazy. And I'm just sitting in the downstairs like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. <laughs> And then at night you would hear things too, like footsteps walking right up to you. And you're just like, man, this is just terrible. But then it wasn't until the very, very last night when I saw the dead cat looking at me and I was just, nope, I'm, I'm out of here. I can't do this. All right. So really briefly before I go, I wanted to talk to you guys about how I almost had a sleep paralysis moment. And this happened around the time when I tested positive for COVID. So if you guys remember, I didn't have COVID symptoms. However, I had hives. I had hives and I was itchy all the time. So my nurse, she recommended I take Zyrtec. So I was taking Zyrtec and, and I had no idea how strong Zyrtec was. So I generally don't take, when I do have hives and stuff, I actually just have an ointment that I put on and then it goes away. I don't actually take medication for my hives. But then, you know, I went and took some Zyrtec and... I felt like I was drugged up for days. Like I only took it for one day and I stopped taking it because I was like just knocking out all of the time. Like I had no idea it was that strong. And so what happened was the, I think this was the first night I had Zyrtec. I was laying on my side and I was sleeping with my arms crossed like this and I was on my side and I was sleeping. And you guys know how I mentioned to you when I, when there's a ghost around, I sleep with my eyes open. So I was sleeping and all of a sudden I was like, I was dreaming, but then I felt like I recognized what I was looking at. And then my eyes started to focus and I saw my closet and I was like, oh shit. <laughs> so I saw my closet and then I saw, I saw a shadow cast over the closet and it had long crazy hair like just imagine in your vision you can see long crazy black hair it's it's so black it's a shadow it is a shadow of long crazy hair that's moving and I remember I was like I can't move I freaking can't move and I was like it's gonna come it's gonna come on me and then as the shadow got up and his face was getting close to me out of nowhere, I'm like this. I just go, ah! I'm like, I start biting it. But then I had already resigned that I was going to get sat on you guys. I mean, I was so drugged up. I was so drowsy. I was like, just go for it. I got, I have no energy. I can't move. And out of nowhere, in real life, I'm like biting at, at something in the air and I actually bit into it and you guys will not know this but it's like imagine it okay because I don't know what it's like either but it felt like biting into a cloud <laughs> it was like okay I guess maybe more like um, a loose balloon that is definitely full <laughs> but when you bite into it like it, it kind of felt like that like that kind of a uh, a bite you know but it's not like rubbery obviously and slipping out of your mouth but that's what it felt like when I bit it and I heard it scream and it ran away <laughs> so that I, I totally forgot about that that it happened but I remember later on I woke up because I went back to bed and so when I woke up the next day I was like oh my god I almost got sad on last night but it, it was the weirdest thing but I will tell y'all this I no longer sleep like this <laughs> Because I'm like, it pretty much traps you because then your shoulder is kind of like over your other arm, keeping it locked in place. So I'm like, I ain't ever going to sleep like that again. <laughs> now, I will definitely say, because I had somebody write to me as well about um, people, God, how did she say this? This is why I need to write stuff down, you guys. 
it was something about, uh, she wanted me to talk about how spirits or animals, how animals, okay, I think it's spiritual animals can stay with an individual for a certain amount of time only, and then they leave because they're kind of done with their job or their duty. And with that being said, yes, that is completely possible. And, um, I know that the whole point of this is that the reason why when I almost got sat on and I had already resigned to getting sat on and then suddenly I started fighting it and attacking it is because I was born with a dragon in me. But I just want to let you guys know that, um, people are actually can be born with a spare animal in them that will actually fight and protect the individual. And as far as that individual is saying, do they leave though? Is there a time when they could leave? Yes, it does depend on the purpose though. Because some people in their life, even with individuals, people in your actual life too, you are only meant to have them for so long to protect you, to get you through that point in your time, in your life, and then they will separate and leave you and then you're supposed to move on. But a lot of people have a hard time with that conception because they just want to hang on to the individual. But in reality, that individual was only meant to be there to help you so much and so long. So the same theory applies to animals as well. So even if you have an animal spirit or even a physical animal or physical human, they could be in your life for only so long until you have reached your peak with them and then they are meant to let you go. That is how it's supposed to happen. Like for myself, for example, I know for a fact that I have certain things that were in my life on purpose to protect me. You know, because I know that my guides know and the spirit world knows that a lot of times I don't listen to nobody. So they will end up bringing certain things to me because that is what I needed in my life at that time to protect me or get me through that point until I can move on in my life. And somebody said something else to me that was really well said, basically, that um, she believes that how my life turned out, that even though, yes, I'm gifted. Um, she basically kind of said that, you know, my guides knew that I actually needed to grow up normal, that I needed this time away. And that's why I'm being granted it, you know, because when you are a shaman, you know, it's very, very lonely. As I've mentioned many times in my other videos, it's very lonely. A lot of people, especially if they can't relate to you and they don't have the same kind of abilities as you mentally they cannot fully help you digest everything and talk about how you're going crazy okay so so you know like um my guides they talk to me so much because they do know that i can be crazy like i think they're crazy sometimes but you know like it's a loving kind of crazy but in reality, if somebody else knew my guides, they would think they were bonkers. But they're pretty normal to me. <laughs> Alright, you guys. So that is it for this video. The next video, I want to talk to you guys about eternal love. If y'all don't know what eternal love is, okay, I didn't know either. So after I posted my videos about um, dragons and then gods, etc. in the spirit world and how it is, a lot of y'all kept writing to me about this Chinese drama called Eternal Love. Do I have a lot to say about that? Okay, so over COVID break, I was able to watch it. Okay, I fast forwarded through a lot of it, okay? <laughs> but I watched it. I am going to break down Eternal Love for you guys. Until next time.